Welcome to Sunday morning worship from the United Church in Winchester. It's wonderful to share in this time of praise and worship with you once again, wherever you are. And we remind ourselves, as we always have done throughout this period, that whether you are worshipping on your own, whether you have other people around you, whether you're in your own home or whether you're somewhere else, we are united together through the love of Jesus. We are the one body of Christ and no one need feel alone. Um, and uh, we must all remind ourselves that we're bound together by God's Holy Spirit working in and through us. So welcome, uh, wherever you're watching from, if you're listening, uh, you are most welcome. Uh, just a, I want to say a few words about uh, the church reopening because no doubt that's something that's uh, on your mind about when that's going to happen. Uh, you may have already read my article in uh, this month's issue of yours and we hinted at, you know, things might start, we might start to look at having a service by uh, the beginning of September or not before September. We're actually looking at seeing if we can accelerate our plans to maybe see if we can open up uh, uh, morning worship on a limited basis um, a little bit earlier than that um, but there's planning that needs to, to be put in place to make that happen and uh, we need to be, obviously be, be sure that it's uh, safe to do so but we'd also really appreciate a feel for whether you would want to be coming back to worship in the church at the moment but are you shielding are you um, are you just wanting to be careful uh, have you been able to access the online worship and have you enjoyed um, uh, that way of connecting uh, together as a church and is, is that enough for the moment or do you really feel that um, you need to return to church? We just want to get a feel of where you are so that we can understand how many people are likely to uh, want to be in the building at any one time. So we're going to be sending out a letter probably in the next week or so and we really appreciate your feedback um, any any thoughts, any points that you'd like to raise with us to give us a better feel as we plan to reopen. The theme of today's service is Choose Childhood and the work of Action for Children because it's Action for Children Sunday. Action for Children believes that every child should grow up safe and happy. To make this vision a reality, they offer practical and emotional care and support, make sure children's voices are heard, and campaign to bring lasting improvements to their lives. Doing this lays the foundations for children to thrive. The work Action for Children does is only possible with our support. The Methodist Church has been by the charity side for more than 150 years. But tragically, there are still thousands of vulnerable children who desperately need our help. With our worship, with our prayers and with our donations, we can make a real difference to these children. Together, we can choose safe and happy childhoods for every child. So with that in mind, we calm our thoughts and our hearts. And as our service will begin in a few moments, let us keep silence and focus on God's unfailing presence with us all, wherever we are. I invite you to join in our call to worship. Heavenly Father, as we gather today with thanksgiving and an open heart, help us to hear you. Fill our hearts with love and compassion for all those you call us to walk alongside. Stir up our hearts and strengthen us to act with justice and righteousness. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing the first of our two hymns this morning. It's the kingdom of God is justice and joy. And if you're following in the hymn books, you can find it at number 255.
we come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, creator of all things, giver of life, we praise and worship you. We thank you that you have always loved the world you have made and that however far we stray from you, your love is always there to welcome us home. We do not deserve your love, but we dare to believe the good news of your mercy declared by our Lord Jesus Christ. Be present with us this day as with penitent and forgiving hearts we celebrate your sacrifice of love. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that our worship may truly express our love for you and for one another. Make us glad and give us joy and peace. God of justice and mercy, we come before you knowing that we are all in need of forgiveness. We have sinned against you in our speaking and in our silence, in our thinking and in our thoughtlessness, in our actions and in our inaction. We have sinned against you in not loving you with our whole heart and soul and strength. In not loving our sisters and brothers in Christ. Grant us, O Lord, your forgiveness. Restore us in the image of your Son and lead us along the way to your kingdom, to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord Jesus, we recognise that you have given each one of us a part to play in your body. We thank you that you believe in us and have a vision for your church. Strengthen us where we are weak. Guard us where we are strong. Give us humility where we are proud and in your patient love continue to call us to serve you wherever and whenever it is needed. Amen. Just to draw our minds back to the work of Action for Children, we're going to watch a short video now which tells Willow's story and how Action for Children helped her. My mum had overdosed and I found her because I remember for months thinking it was my fault. I went to school thinking she died. I became homeless when I was 18. I'd kind of given up at this point because my mental health went downhill as well. So like in 2013, I'd overdosed. I felt like everything was crumbling around me and like the tighter I held, the looser it became. When I was living in my car, Funnily enough, the thing that scared me the most was the windows because I always get worried that someone will pop up. It got really cold. I didn't know like how my body would deal with the temperature change. I kept going to ASDA. I was at ASDA at 3am because I needed to pee <laughs> and it's 24 hours. Like, It's little things like that. Like, I still want to keep my dignity. Like, At that point in my life, I felt so lost. I got involved with Action for Children and they were going to put me in my own flat. They wondered whether assisted accommodation would be a better option. You're just supported a lot more to then be ready to get your own place. If I feel bad at 3am, I can come down and speak to somebody if they've got night staff on. I know there's times where I've felt I've had nobody, but being here I always now feel like I've got somebody, there's always somebody I could go to because there's always somebody about. My confidence has grown, I'm not having as many panic attacks, like my mental health is so much better. It's my life, I'm in control now. I'm finally starting to enjoy things again, like I feel like I'm finally living life now. So, Willow's story.
and a stark reminder of how uh, some children have really, really hard lives and the importance of charities like Action for Children in helping them to actually change uh, something that's gone wrong. Now, of course, usually as part of a service like this, we want to make a donation. Um, often we'd have envelopes and people would put in uh, uh, money or, or, or some other form of pledge um, to support this work. We can't do that. But um, I'm, I'm certainly hopeful that maybe later in the year when we are able to worship together, we can uh, have uh, some of those envelopes and give donations. But I would really encourage you uh, now to um, think about whether you might like to make a donation online. If you go to the Action for Children website, there are ways in which uh, we can donate to support their work. So please do give that, give that a think. And if you're not comfortable with donating online, just make a note of it as something to come back to and something that you want to, to give to um, uh, later, down, late, later in the year. This morning's readings come from the book of Jeremiah and the gospel according to St. Luke. And I'm very pleased that Ian and Marjorie Monroe um, are reading our lessons for us this morning. So over to them. The reading this morning is from Jeremiah chapter 22, reading from verses one to five. Thus says the Lord, Go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, sitting on the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord, Act with justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor anyone who has been robbed and do no wrong or violence to the alien, the orphan, and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you will indeed obey this word, then through the gates of this house shall enter kings who sit on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their servants and their people. But if you will not heed these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. The Gospel reading this morning is from St. Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me. So bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Let us pray. Eternal God, who longs for us to know all good things and to walk along a peaceful path, open the eyes of our hearts that we may see the way to life. Open our ears that we may hear the truth. Open our lips that we may praise you this day and all our days. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now, 
I know you've probably heard me uh, read read this before, but I'm hoping that you'll indulge me and allow it to to read. Uh, allow me to read this to you once again. It's one of my favourite little kind of reflections by uh, Rabbi Lionel Blue, and uh, I'm sure many of you will uh, remember uh, his contributions on radio, um, and I find some of his writing tremendously perceptive and, and witty at the same time. And uh, uh, again, if, if, you've, if you remember hearing me read this one in church before, um, then apologies for that, um, but I think, it's, uh, I think it's worth hearing a few times. It's entitled Heaven and Hell. There was a rabbi who wanted to see both heaven and hell. And God, who has hidden from us the opposites and their unity, gave way to his pleading. The rabbi found himself before a door, which bore no name. He trembled as he saw it open before him. It gave into a room, and all was prepared for a feast. There was a table, and at its centre a great dish of steaming food. The smell and the aroma inflamed the appetite. The diners sat around the table with great spoons in their hands, yet they were shrieking with hunger and fainting with thirst in that terrible place. They tried to feed themselves and gave up, cursing God, the author and origin of their torment. For the spoons God had provided were so long that they could not reach their faces and get the food to their tongues. They stretched out their arms, but their mouths remained empty. So they starved because of these spoons, while the dish of plenty lay amongst them. And the rabbi knew that their shriekings were the cries of hell. And as knowledge came, the door closed before him. He shut his eyes in prayer and begged God to take him away from that terrible place. When he opened them again, he despaired, for the same door stood before him, the door that bore no name. Again it opened and it gave on to the same room. Nothing had changed, and he was about to cry in horror. There was the table and at its centre the steaming bowl, and around it were the same people, and in their hands the same spoons. Yet the shriekings had gone, and the cries and the curses had changed to blessings, and nothing had changed, yet everything. For with the same long spoons they reached to each other's faces, and fed each other's mouths. And they gave thanks to God, the author and origin of their joy. And as the rabbi heard the blessings, the door closed. He bent down, and he too blessed God, who had shown him the nature of heaven and hell. And the chasm, a hair's breadth wide, that divides them. I wanted to read that um, short story uh, to you once again because I think our readings this morning are all about attitudes. The attitudes that we have, the attitudes that we choose to take, the attitudes that we choose to have, the judgments that we make, the compassion that we offer to the lost and the lonely the abused, the oppressed, the captive of our world. When Jeremiah says for us to act with justice and righteousness, how do we respond to that? Do we respond in one way or another? When Jesus tells the people in the synagogue that he is the one who has come to fulfill that scripture in their hearing. Do we join with Jesus in that call? Do we feel similarly commissioned to bring good news to the poor, 
release to the captive and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Because much of that is about how we are as people and how we choose to live and to view people and to judge people and how, and how our attitudes shape us and form us. What are our attitudes towards the oppressed, the abused, the orphaned, the captive? Now I'm sure in polite company we'd all say, well of course we're very compassionate and we, uh, we would always want to do whatever we can to help. But in private, behind closed doors, in the confines of our own minds, did we find that self-same sacrificial attitude? How often are we prepared to sacrifice what we have, the comfort in which we live, the things that make us secure, to actually be vulnerable for those who are so vulnerable every single day? Because that's the thing with attitudes, we can uh, walk the walk, or we can at least talk the talk, but unless it's a heart change inside us, unless we see the world in a different way, unless we challenge one another as church to really, really look at our perceptions of people, and look at our perceptions of those who are struggling, those maybe who are from a different social class, those who come from a different background, those of a different race or religion, those of a different gender or sexual identity. How are our attitudes formed? What is it that we actually think about when we see images of people uh, being lost and oppressed and abused when we see the homeless person in the street? Do we feel compassion and empathy for that person? Do we secretly feel, oh well, they've got themselves where they are, that's their choice? And maybe there's some truth to that. But surely we're called to have empathy and compassion for those around us. Far too often, our responses, and particularly our responses when, when we're comfortable, are responses of judgment. Our attitude is one that says, well, uh, you know, there are reasons for that. Our attitude might be to say, well, you know, our life is better because we've done things differently. Well, I think we all know that we've all made mistakes. We've all got things wrong. We've all got skeletons in our, in our cupboards. We've all got things that we're not proud of, things that we've, uh, things that we've, we've just simply not got right in our lives at times. And what that should hopefully bring about is a level of understanding, a level of shared responsibility for the fact that sometimes life just does go wrong. I'm sure the children in uh, that uh, are. Uh, are being helped by Action for Children haven't chosen the path that they uh, have ended up having to take. Very often it's because of things that have been done to them. But still, the stigma of being abused as a child is one that follows people around. People make judgments about that. People have an attitude towards uh, those people and what it means. Instead, we should act with compassion and with understanding. Think back to when we were able to meet as a church and when people came into the coffee bar or maybe they came to coffee bar playtime. Did we judge them? Did we uh, think about who they might be because of the difficulties they, they were having at the time? Or were we compassionate? Did we try and understand where they were coming from? 
because that's the difference in attitude. It's the same picture, it's the same people. What changes our response and what makes it more Christ-like, what enables us to respond as Jesus responded, as Jeremiah is calling us to respond here, is just a hair's breadth change in attitude, in how we view the world. It's an attitude that shows compassion. It's an attitude that longs for forgiveness and reconciliation. It's an attitude that desires to have empathy. We can't always empathize with everything that other people are going through, but to try and empathize to try and walk a mile in someone else's shoes and to not be so quick to judge. What's our attitude like? What's our attitude like on the inside? And I would challenge myself with that question and some of the uh, prejudices that I have in my head. I would still challenge myself with that same question. I'm not standing on uh, I'm on my laurels here, I'm not standing on a soapbox. We all need to look very hard at our attitudes and what has defined them and where they need to change. I've been thought, thinking quite a lot recently about the more far-reaching consequences of the coronavirus pandemic, as I'm sure you have been doing too. And of course, the human tragedy of all the lives that have been lost or physically and mentally affected by contracting the virus and, and suffering from it are, are terrible. But there are other consequences that we're going to be finding are just as devastating, if not possibly more so, over the coming months and years. The financial worries that many people will have especially as government packages and help come to an end and some of them some people haven't even been able to access some of that help i've talked to lots and lots of people who just simply haven't been able to access that help for one reason or another and whose livelihoods have been absolutely decimated what about abuse what about domestic abuse which we hear is on the rise. What about men, women, children finding themselves in environments, especially because of the lockdown, where they've not been able to escape abuse from someone, from someone else? What about the cost on our mental health? So many people have been struggling with anxiety and panic worry, depression, not being able to do the things that they, that they normally uh, do, the things that normally ground us and give us, I guess, a reason to, to, to get up every day. And it's clear to me that the increase in need is absolutely massive. And that these things can happen to absolutely anyone. They could happen to me, and they could happen to you. But do we, in a way, have an attitude that says if, if we succumb to one of these things, we've somehow, you know, failed, that we've not got it sorted, that we've not been strong enough, that people will think that we're weak or that we're needy, it's been so important over recent years that we've got better at talking about mental health. But there's still a massive stigma that surrounds it. People still have a very skewed attitude at times of what mental ill health is all about. And yet so many people suffer from it. We must get better at telling our stories. We must get better at sharing that responsibility sharing that, that story of when it goes wrong for us in terms of our mental health. I've been there, and I know many of you have too. Let's share those stories and make sure people don't feel stigmatised because they're suffering. 
been really interesting talking to uh, Winchester Basics Bank because as you can imagine with the financial situation of many their resources have been called on a lot more but they've also found that there's lots of people who really need their help but aren't who aren't asking for help and why because it comes down to attitude because it comes down to how they worry about how people will see them if they ask for help. Too much of our uh, language is about the needy and is not actually really kind of encouraging us to think that these things can happen to anyone. It always um, made me think um, whenever I've been working with the Basics Bank where they've said, you know, somebody out there is only one wage away from needing a basics bank parcel. They lose that income, if they lose their livelihood, just like that as many have done, then even those that have been very well paid can find themselves needing that kind of support. So it's not just this idea, this judgment, this stigma of who is needy who needs help. We all need help. We all need to ask for help. We all need to be seen to be asking for help. And certainly the Basics Bank are doing a lot in, in their new approach and a new leaflet that they've, uh, that they've put together, which is trying to do something to change that, uh, that kind of stereotypical language to change people's attitudes, to make people understand that actually it's only by working together and only by realising both our weakness and therefore our strength in realising weakness and working together that we can actually improve people's lives. Returning to the heaven and hell uh, story which I started with. Which version will you be a character in? Will you be a character in the image of hell, trying to feed yourself, trying to manage yourself, trying to be the one that says, I can do this, I don't need any help. Trying to be the one that says, I'm the strong one. Or are you going to be like one of the characters from the image of heaven, realising our need for other people's help, realising our need to be compassionate, to empathise, to, to walk a mile in another person's shoes, to realise that they are only experiencing in their moment of need what we have often experienced in our own moments of need. Let us, like Jesus, be sent and commissioned to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Thanks be to God. Amen. come now to our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Loving God, today we lift up the work of Action for Children. We think of all the families who come into contact with the charity and pray your blessing over them. We think of those struggling with their physical or mental health and pray that your peace descends on them. Lord, remove any barriers, particularly those where people have prejudices, where people's attitudes are skewed, where people are worried about stigma. Remove any of those barriers that may prevent people from reaching out. We 
We thank you for the work of Action for Children and pray that you would sustain them. Give them the energy and, and enthusiasm they need to lovingly support those most in need. We pray for the staff and volunteers at the charity and all the resources they have that help them to reach out and serve communities across the UK. We pray for our wider society, particularly at this time of tremendous challenge. We ask that your will be done from Westminster all the way down to our communities. We ask that lives led by love, love modelled so perfectly by Christ, transform us and the world we live in. Healing God, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you bring healing to any child or young person who has been the victim of abuse or neglect. They are your children and have been called into your wonderful light. Show them that you see them and know them and know what they're going through. Show that you are right beside them. No matter how terrible the situation, we pray that they will know that they can lean on you. Open our eyes, Lord, to see any potential signs of abuse and remove every form of ignorance from us. Give these children and young people hope and provide healing in their body, soul and mind. Ease their suffering, gracious God, and bring about restoration in their lives. And as we think about the work of Action for Children and those whom they help, we think about the needs of our own lives. We think about the work of our church and we remember people, loved ones, situations, that particularly need our thoughts and prayers at this time. And I place before you once again our prayer bowl. And in a few moments of quiet, I invite you to in some way visualize putting prayers into this bowl, concerns that are on your heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As Jesus taught us, so now we pray together, saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing our second hymn together. It's Will You Come and Follow Me If I But Call Your Name? And if you're following in the hymn books, you'll find it at number 673.
So to close our service, we're going to have uh, a couple of different things which I invite you to uh, join in with. First of all, we're going to uh, share together in the Action for Children Covenant, which I invite you to read along with me. Then there'll be a uh, blessing, which again is responsive, so please do respond uh, to those words. And then finally, we'll share the grace. And then as our voluntary this week, we're actually going to see a video produced for Pentecost um, by the churches in Winchester, and they're going to be singing a blessing. Some of you may have already seen it from the Pentecost service that took place, but I want us to invite, um, as, I want to invite you as we listen to that um, to be praying your blessing over your loved ones, over our church, and over the church communities in Winchester and all those they seek to serve. So let us share in reading the Action for Children Covenant. Every child has the right to live, to be safe and to be loved. Every young person has the right to be housed, to have enough money, to live in dignity and to have enough support for the future. Every young person has the right to justice, to realise their potential and to be given the space to become independent. In an often cruel and imperfect world, we uphold the work of action for children, with children and young people in danger, in need and at risk. We support the growth of this work and the pursuit of all these rights for the young, the discounted and the vulnerable. We make this covenant with Action for Children for the sake of all God's children. Amen. Go and tell, for God is gracious and merciful and full of love. Go and live, for God's compassion embraces us all. Go and give thanks, for God is faithful and blesses us. And so may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us and remain with us this day and forevermore. Amen. And let us close by sharing the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. May the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. May the Lord bless you and
the Lord bless you and keep you. And protect you. And guard you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. God smile on you and gift you. And be gracious to you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord turn his face toward you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And give you peace. up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.